classic old one. <laughs> Just don't stand a lot of ways. Stop. Right, good morning. And uh, today, then, the let's turn to another topic. Uh, the topic is really the hydrogen fuel cells. And uh, so, the, in most cases, uh, the hydrogen fuel cells are a little bit confusing. And people are often, often asking is it the actual chemical devices and what's the difference between the, the battery? In a sense, we release electric current, uh, that's safe. So the fuel cell will release the current, and the battery will release current. <coughs> in a sense, on the other side, it's totally different. One. Fuel cell is a chemical reactor, and the battery is simply is a, a electrochemical energy storage unit. So they, from that sense, it's totally different. So fuel cell, rather like an engine, is not a storage, it's just a producer. It's not energy storage. Storage and actually it's an energy producer, so that's the fundamental difference, and actually that's made fuel cell much more attractive. So what we're saying is, I mean, let's give a general introduction. What is the fuel cell? What's the fundamental principles? And what is the fuel cell generator? I mean, as a generating system, what the system looks like? So that's what I end up with. So first, from the cell, from the very basic unit, and on the fuel cell. And uh, then we go to the stack. So the cell is good, but it's not powerful enough. If you need a big enough power to drive the vehicle, you need uh, to stack all the cells together to produce the stack. So that's a whole lot. Overview. So what we're going to talk about. So the few things we're going to talk to about today, let's have a general introduction. And the next thing important is uh, the PM, the pan fuel cell. So the proton exchange membrane fuel cell. So that's a specific fuel cell we can talk about. There are other technologies as well. So for this um, a couple of hours, and uh, the other fuel cells we're not really going to discuss in details. <coughs> Reason quite simple. And uh, the reacting environment, the structure of the other type of fuel cells is not really suitable, very suitable for automotive industry. So for the automotive or for all the mobile applications, uh, pan fuel cell gave uh, a significant advantage. So that's why we're going to talk about this one. 
and also what is the operation, and finally what the stack looks like. So basically, the process is I mean from the right beginning, which is the proton membrane, the proton a chain membrane. Basically, it's the membrane from the membrane to the single cell, from the single cell to the stack, and from the stack form into a few cell system, and that system can be used as an engine. Then you can put it into the vehicle and then propel the vehicle. So that's the few things to talk about. First, yeah, so the very basic thing is the fuel cell is an electrochemical device. Uh, that is fundamentally is an electrochemical reaction. And uh, that's made a very made the fuel cell very different from a combustion engine. So combustion engine is a thermal energy device. So it's converted to thermal energy in Chemical energy. And the fuel cell is an electrochemical reaction of device. It's converted the chemical energy from the fuel, hydrogen, into electricity. So that's not into chemical power. So convert the chemical energy to electric energy, but through oxidation reduction reaction, so what we take for electrochemical reaction. The fuel cells are basically different types. And all depends on the electrochemical reaction, different chemical, uh, electrochemical reaction. And then basically they end up with uh, quite a, a few different technologies. One technology is uh, based on the proton. So basically you've got a hydrogen, by the time you remove the electron from a uh, hydrogen uh, atom, you end up with a proton. So if you play or somehow control the proton, manage the proton, you end up with a proton exchange. And the exchange is happened through a medium, and that medium can be a membrane medium. If it's a membrane, this means it's a solid. It's a solid medium. And in other way, you can call it a solid electrolyte. But the membrane is functioning as an electrolyte. It's only because it is an electrolyte then they can get a proton into it and then take it out. Right? And that electrolyte in this particular technology is in the form of a solid membrane. Right? So therefore, this kind of fuel cells often have two type, two names. Right? And so commonly it's regarded as a PAN, I say PAN fuel cell. The PAN stands for proton exchange membrane, so the PAN. And sometimes it's also called solid electrolyte fuel cell. So SEFC, solid electrolyte fuel cell. So we're talking about the same thing. But in most cases, now the standard globally, we all recognize the same pump fuel cell. But the pump fuel cell used in the field is hydrogen. Right? And so hydrogen, obviously, the hydrogen is clearly linked with the proton. Using the hydrogen to generate the proton and using this particular electrolyte, the membrane type electrolyte, to really conduct the current. But, and the important part is here. The working temperature is above 100 degrees C, so it is a low temperature. Actually, it can be so low when you're talking about the cold start, the automotive the cold start. The cold start for this kind of technology, and the proving ones, can go as low as minus 30, even lower than that. Uh, but generally, if you're talking about to the famous, uh, the big brands of automotive industry, let's say Toyota, um, they can guarantee it is a minus 25 degrees C without a system. So it's a cold start without a system. You can always put the electrical system to warm it up and then cold start. And uh, that is a much more complicated system. For this particular technology, uh, you don't, don't really need it. If you design a fuel cell, I mean, good enough, you don't need an external system to put on it. So that is the major interest. So now, when you look at this particular technology, you may find already a few cases down here. Right? First, the electrolyte is solid, uh, it's a membrane. The solid one is much easier to handle. But if it's a liquid, it's much difficult to handle. So it's a solid. Second is it a fuel, then fuel or it's called hydrogen. And thirdly, the important part, the important feature of this kind of system is 
low time pressure. And the low time pressure means high pressure. It's automatically going to give you that idea. But when we're talking about uh, um, a combustion engine, they always complain. The combustion engine, internal combustion engine efficiency is going to be low because it's based on the high time pressure, right? the thermal energy, like high time pressure. But this one is based on the electrochemical energy uh, at low time pressure efficiency from the high. Well, there are other competitive technologies behind it. Alkaline fuel cell, <coughs> AFC, we don't really use it uh, I mean, uh, at this moment really for automotive applications. And uh, it's used the fuel hydrogen as well. It can operate at relatively low temperature, compar comparative, competitively with uh, the pump fuel cell. And uh, the difficulty inside here it is uh, the alkaline itself, but, and uh, it is uh, in the liquid form. It's not in a solid. And uh, once it is not in solid, it's difficult to handle the impact of the current, which means that potentially your system is bigger than it should be. Hand fuel cell sensor, it is a solid uh, membrane, and the system can be much more compact. So that's why if it's not so compact, and if it's not so easy to handle, it's going to be difficult to be used in the automobile industry. So that is the problem of that one. So therefore, we're not really talking too much about uh, AFC for automobile applications at the moment. Although the other features are more or less the same. But actually, that's the one is the first being used in a practical system. Um, it's the first few cell actually practically being if you're interested, um, the dig out a little bit of history is Apollo. You know, Americans, uh, the NASA, and uh, they send Apollo to the moon. On the moon, there's a moon, uh, and the you know, moon surface investigator. That vehicle actually is powered by Apollo itself, but it's not by Pant itself, it's by Apollo itself. So it is the first one, first technology being practically put in practice. Uh, and another fuel cell, quite interesting, and um, it's direct methanol fuel cell. And uh, so by name, it is using the methanol as a fuel. It's not hydrogen, it's using the methanol as a fuel. And the operating temperature, again, is at the low. It's below 100 degrees C. So in a way, this technology, direct methanol fuel cell, is very close to pan fuel cell. You see, I mean, the temperature is the same. And the direct methanol fuel cell use a solid membrane as well, so it's a kind of easy to, to stack up to build and a kind of a, 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 a simple system. But, so that one has shown a great interest over the last 20, 30 years. A lot of people think, um, I think um, it holds a great potential for being a strong candidate, um, a competitor to plant fuel cell especially for the mobile applications. But, uh, but in reality, there is a difficulty, um, has a big difficulty behind it. The difficulty is the power of processing. Uh, it's not high. Uh, although the fuel energy density, volume density in particular, uh, methanol is significantly higher than hydrogen. You know, hydrogen is the lightest gas, but by mass, Hydrogen energy contents is very high, it's two times, more than three times higher than gasoline. But by mass, by volume, it's nothing. But it's the lightest of gas. But uh, methanol, by volume, the energy contents uh, is almost compatible with gasoline. But, and uh, so, therefore, it's significantly higher than hydrogen. So, which means if you try to store methanol on board of your vehicle, it's almost uh, like a petrol tank. Or similar, but, uh, but if you try to store hydrogen on board of your vehicle, you really need to think hard. How can you store I mean, enough hydrogen on board of your vehicle? So that's why we end up with the extremely high pressure. <coughs> but <coughs> 350 bar, that's a low pressure storage system, 200 bar, I mean 700 bar for high pressure storage system. For passenger vehicles, it's almost Guarantee uh, is almost globally agreed. We need to go 700 bar. 
the store, enough hydrogen to propel a metal gain or a passenger vehicle a reasonable range. And reasonable range is well over 400 kilometers. If you look at, if you're interested in that details, there's a one particular vehicle you do need to understand properly. It is a new one, um, the Toyota new one. Um, the, I will, I mean, possibly I showed in the comments that say it is the best, but technically, it is the one really a proper demonstration, and it's so good that you can use it as a daily. So basically, you can use it as a daily combination. If you have hydrogen, and uh, you have to use that's good as that. And uh, so that is uh, they're using that one. So that's the direct mass of it. So it is a good potentially is a very valuable technology, <clears throat> but currently there's a problem. The problem is the fuel cell itself. The energy output density or the power output density is far too low. I mean, how low comparing this pump fuel cell is around one tenth. So it's almost a mix, ten times bigger. So that's uh, the, the problem of this one. <coughs> Plenty of space needs to improve this technology. Well, if we can have some breakthrough for direct mass load, it may become a strong competitor to pump fuel cell. Others, well, there's a phosphoric acid uh, hydrogen fuel cell and uh, operating temperature a bit high and uh, working medium with electrolyte. Again, it's a liquid, so it's not very interesting. The molten carbonate uh, fuel cell, MCF, uh, MCFC, and uh, the beauty of it, you can use the natural gas, and uh, but operating temperature is a bit too high for cold start. Forget about cool stuff. Yeah, 600, <coughs> 700 degrees is not good for cool stuff. Finally, there's another one solid oxide fuel cell. But the beauty of it is on the word solid. So, uh, as good as this one, the beauty of this one is uh, solid, it's a membrane. And this one, again, is the solid electrolyte. So, it has a good uh, feature. The problem for using this technology for automotive is here. Operating temperature again is too high, and it's not suitable for switch on, switch off, and then switch on again. So it's not good for that kind of technology. But it's very good for power generation as a constant unit. For example, you use it as a power generator on site, and uh, or <coughs> you use it for slightly different purpose, such as marine. When you got a marine vessel, marine ship, when the switch on, it's about floating the ocean for three months. That's that's perfect technology. But uh, for your passenger or family car, that's not just an awful question. So the beauty of this one, that's a difficulty with that. The beauty of this one is the requirement on the quality of the fuel. Uh, because it's at a high temperature, the catalyst in this kind of fuel cell is insensitive to the quality of the fuel. You wish. In other words, you can put uh, a poor quality hydrogen into it, it doesn't poison, uh, doesn't poison the catalyst. But at a low temperature, it's going to be very sensitive. So that's the beauty of it. You, even you can put natural gas in, and uh, so straight into solid oxide fuel cell and produce the, the power. <clears throat> the power output density is very compatible with uh, the pump fuel cell. That's the beauty of it. The only problem down here is a high temperature, and you have to hold the high temperature like that. That forms a significant, a huge challenge. Materials that is, right? you have to design system constantly working in the so called 7 800 degrees C, and you have to seal the gas. Right? So that is uh, the challenge, and uh, which is uh, since it's not really suitable for automotive, we're not really talking. This one. So when you look at all the potential technologies, we end up with very much the pump fuel cell really for automotive. Why pump fuel cell for automotive applications? What is the reason? There's an interesting data is from this company, and this is information mainly on the hydrogen fuel cell and clean energy company. So if you're interested. Uh, look into this company's website. They have a lot of good mass report. 
trying to discuss about it. Um, that's a clear prediction. The, the global demand for fuel cell vehicles is increasing. Right? And the global demand on fuel cells is also among the increasing. And uh, so when, when you look at it, that is the plan to itself. So that is really the, the percentage of the plan to itself. So all the others, another strong candidate you can see, as I just mentioned, is the FOFH solid or fuel cell. So that becomes quite important. So that's the two key technology besides uh, really the fuel cell I mean, market and application. And why choose PAN? The, the very important thing for automotive, as we mentioned, I remember, is really I mean, the energy you need to move the vehicle is to follow the very basic physical law. So basically, it's the mass and the distance. Right? If you try to move such a big mass with, uh, to such a, such a distance, you do need so much power. Right? The, the way to improve the efficiency to reduce the power to move the mass from A to B is to reduce the total mass. Right? So anything bulking to put, I mean, uh, add extra weight into the total mass, you lost energy efficiency. So that's uh, the argument behind it. So among all the fuel cells, um, the hydrogen, the, the pan fuel cell give you the highest power output density. So therefore, that's naturally the smallest by volume and by mass to produce the same amount of the power. So that's why it's more attractive the mobile application. Right? And uh, vibration distance. Since internally, they're kind of a solid structure. Right? And uh, so it can stand the vibration, the, the harsh environment of the automotive. And if it's a liquid, it's not such a good uh, system for automotive application. Another thing is a fast startup. Well, that's quite important for us as a start, stop, start, stop. That's the reason why the IC and the internal combustion engine becomes so attractive for automotive industry. Because it's easy to stop and easy to start. Right? And the pan fuel cell is kind of close enough for the stop and the start performance with uh, the internal combustion engine. But of course, uh, the, uh, need to pay something for this kind of performance. But something is uh, the catalyst. The catalyst is a little bit expensive. It needs the precious metal, basically it's the platinum, uh, so the catalyst. So, and uh, using platinum as a catalyst uh, uh, to really convert uh, the hydrogen to protons, the beauty of that is low temperature and it is a uh, high response. Right? So it's a, it's a good, very good way to convert, to generate a chemical reaction. The downside of it is pretty sensitive. The plasma as a catalyst is very sensitive to impurities, so such as the carbon monoxide, such as the methane, such as the sulfur, and kind of traces of the sulfur, and it will damage the catalyst very quickly. So that is not perfect. So reactions. Reactions is deadly simple. Right? And uh, for the pump fuel cell, since it's talking about electrochemical reaction, really. I mean, we're talking about the two very, very basic electric reactions. Right? And for this kind of reaction, it's very much came from here. Right? And when you get hydrogen, hydrogen means, I mean, overall can react with oxygen. And when these two react, you produce water. So that is a very basic reaction. And uh, so, at the right beginning, um, the people, I mean, when they're doing the research, I think I didn't bring the history. So the very history thought, uh, I mean, that about 200 years ago, first found is the proving the water is consisted of hydrogen and carbon. The way to prove it, they electrolyze the water. So basically put a current through the water and you end up with one end, one electron get the hydrogen, another electron get, get oxygen. But about 50 years later, that's kind of a late 19th century, and uh, there's a gentleman called Gu, as well as a few self is almost uh, the starting point of the first person. That's the international conference, the few conference is called Gu conference. Uh, uh, the Mr. Gu 
uh, fund approve um, approve the principle. If you get a water and the hydrogen reactor together, you can generate an electric current. So that is uh, the first fundamental principle for FIMSAL. So the way to achieve that is you get an anode. You let put the an anode is a catalytic. It's coated with the catalyst. So catalytic anode will have the capability to convert hydrogen, hydrogen atom into protons and also deliver the electrons. So the interesting part here is the electrons. Electrons, if you can take the electrons to go through external circuit, you've got current. So that is the one. Once you've got the current, of course, you've got the electric power. And on the opposite side, you need a cathode. The cathode is what we found is if oxygen passes through the catalyst, again, it's a platinum, it will convert into oxygen ions, and that ions will have the um, capability, has a potential to react with the protons and form into water. Right? And of course, for this reaction, is the need to take the electrons. Takes the electron, join in the reaction, and produce water. So we end up with if you just simply look at the two reactions here, that can be very simply translated. If I have an electrode called anode, if I supply hydrogen to this anode, and on this anode will convert the hydrogen into two parties. One is the electrons, one is the proton. So, if you can imagine you generate a system, take the proton in one direction, take uh, the electron into another direction. Uh, then you think about on the opposite side, I got another electrode, and name it as a cathode. You supply oxygen. Once you supply oxygen here, it will convert, has the power to take an electron, uh, force the electron into oxygen. Uh, it converts into oxygen ions. Once you form the oxygen ion, the ion will have the potential to take to react with proton and form with water. Right? That's a sort of a natural force here. And so you end up with if I can supply proton in one direction and supply electron on another direction into the electrode called cathode, so I end up with a reaction forming water on this end. So the question, the challenge becomes where uh, you build up the bridge for electrons and where to build a bridge for protons. If you can build two separate bridges, right, to link one called cathode, one called electrode, right, and I got a bridge for proton, I got a separate bridge for electron. The separate bridge for electron is called electric current. But you end up with the electric current, and that electric current multiply the naturally the the potential, the electrochemical potential between hydrogen and oxygen, you end up with a power. That power sounds like a battery. It is true, it's equivalent to a battery. But, and then the challenge is then you end up with another challenge is the bridge for proton. How can you get a proton from one surface into another surface? Actually, without any discussion detail, you can already think about this now as a small question. Right? So, I need to build up a bridge to let a proton transfer from one end to another end. Let's say I need to build a bridge from one end transfer into another end, a proton. Think about a proton. Possibly, it is the smallest possible atoms you can think about it. How can you transfer it? Anybody give you the idea? Give me a good guess. Huh? Electronics. Huh? Electrolyte. Yeah. And what do you mean, electrolyte? <laughs> give a further description. I think uh, a lot of us are mechanical engineers. But electrolyte is a good term if you're working as an electrochemist. That's a straight way. I can't understand it properly. But can you describe a little bit further? Mm -hmm. well, porous. And 
the poorest possible, yeah, uh, I guess, I, guess, I assume that somebody will listen, but I will say, make some suggestions like that. That's a problem. Because it's so small, you cannot really build any kind of physical material, physical filter to filter any other items, so just like proton passing. It's, it's fundamentally it's not possible when you think about it. Proton is so small, you cannot simply generate a physical filter to do that. The physical way of building that particular bridge to let the proton pass through nothing else because it's almost impossible. But, so the only way it becomes possible actually Electrolyte. And uh, so, electrolyte, in a way, think about it. What is a proton? If you put a proton into the water, what you end up with? Proton in water. Uh, if you dissolve the protons in the water, you end up with what? The pH value. pH value is a function of protons inside, right? And if you put a lot of protons in the water, in the liquid, you end up with what? Alkaline or, or acid? You end up with acid, right? So that is the way we do the things. If you have a pool of water, assume you have a pool of water, right? fundamentally it's acid, and you put a proton into it. When it's oversaturated, it's fatty out. Right? The ticket out is you once you've got another chemicals and turn to Absorb the proton, react with the proton, form into something else. For example, oxygen ions it has a strong potential to react with the proton and form into the water. And you've got a pool of protons there. But it's quite easy is you don't let, need to let the physical movement of the proton. What you need is to dissolve proton in one way and react in another way. And in the middle, if you roughly keep the proton constant, concentration constant, that is the electrolyte, basically. When we define the electrolyte, there's a tons of chemical ways to define it. But I try to ask you to explain a little bit is really how can you explain to the public member and how to explain to the mechanical engineer? So mechanical engineer is quite simple to think about it. What is the membrane all about? The membrane all about is acid uh, acidity. It's acid, right? and acid function of it is to get proton not transfer over. It doesn't. It's a dissolve, but right? it can absorb the proton into this membrane. One way to dissolve in, another way to take it out through reaction. Right? Itself doesn't let proton transfer at all. Right? Let's open another question already we saw some discussing. Uh, you've got this uh, membrane, for example, we said it's a solid membrane. Assume I know it is a solid membrane here, and I would like it to dissolve the proton. How can you dissolve the proton? Proton itself doesn't join in any kind of solid materials. Uh, you need another party to do that. Another party is just like an acid. You do need uh, water. You need water to do that. So basically, this membrane or electrolyte need to be properly soaked with water. But once it's soaked with water, then it has the capability really to get uh, the proton into the dissolved membrane, the, the water from the uh, saturated electrolyte and then only by doing that you have the capacity really to react with the proton on the other side. By doing that indirectly you build up the bridge to let the proton from anode transfer into cathode to form that bridge. Uh, that's indirectly and actually it's not physically it's a chemically to build that bridge. For electrons to pass around you can build uh, basically it's a physical, it's just a wire through a resistor or through a load unit, which is called current, but uh, the electron pass through an external circuit. So that's already explained the basic fundamental sense about the fuel cell. So the fuel cell, so therefore, 
we have the proton on one side, we need to get the proton to another side. But, and then we can form uh, we can form this indirect grid. And also, we need to get uh, the electrons from anode, also the electrons to the other side, to cathode. We need to build another bridge. But, and once you build these two bridges, you end up with this overall reaction. But it's quite simple. The overall reaction is the hydrogen from the anode will react with the oxygen on the cathode, and then at the cathode will produce the water. Uh, so that is the system. And inside of the entire system, the water is very important. The water is not simply a product at the cathode, as we said. The membrane needs water. But uh, need water to be able to dissolve the proton and then provide the proton to the other side. So that is the key. In reality, that technically, that is really the key question. How can you manage that? If you cannot manage it properly and it's dry, you lost the efficiency. Of course, too much water, then later on we'll see there are physical, the metabolic inside, you'll flood the entire fuel cell and you lost the efficiency as well. The water becomes a very tricky sensor to handle it. That's it. Well, so now we're jumping into the details. So we understand the demand. Uh, think about demand, a very simple term. I need to build the two bridges. I need to not only build it, I need to make the two bridges a kind of a transfer traffic free, basically, as easy as possible, which means a proper control. Well, so in reality, that's what this happens. Well, for the fuel cells, uh, the structure itself is fairly simple. In a way, on the macro scale, the structure looks like it's a much much, much simpler than internal combustion. We don't have so many moving parts, but the IC engine has too many moving parts. For a fuel cell itself, the moving parts are the molecule, it's not the structure. So that's the beauty of it. From, therefore, from a macro scale, the structure is quite straightforward. Of course, the micro scale, the nano scale, the structure, there's a much, much more demanding. But, but let's look at it from the macro side. And uh, the structure is quite simple. So we got first, most important stuff is in the middle, that's called the membrane. And the membrane function is to get the proton from the anode transfer into opposite called cathode. Right? So that's the membrane function. So function is to get a proton transfer over, but not hydrogen. Hydrogen cannot transfer to the other side. Then if it happens, that's called crossover, and you lost energy efficiency. And oxygen, oxygen cannot transfer to the other side. It has to stop. But if oxygen come over, it will promote the oxidation of the anode side to destroy the catalyst very quickly. But so oxygen cannot go here, and hydrogen cannot go to the other side. The only thing can be transferred is proton. But so therefore. It cannot be a physical filter. If it's a physical filter, it's quite difficult to manage that. But if it's an electrolyte, and then you can guarantee almost to achieve that purpose. So next to it, and uh, is on one side of it, you need the catalyst. The function of the catalyst basically the black dots along the surface. The catalyst is really convert to the hydrogen at the catalyst part into proton and into um, proton plus electrons. Basically. Then you go to the electrons at the catalyst, catalyst and need to flow back to the current collector and then let the, from the current collector you go out, that's called the anode. And after the catalyst, the hydrogen becomes a proton, proton join the other side. On the other side, we have to have the, I mean, again, has a, the surface go to the catalyst. On that catalyst, well, it will collect the electrons to the opposite current, color, uh, current collector and supply to the catalyst. And also on that catalyst, the oxygen well has the potential then to take the proton and take the electrons and form into the water. 
and the water needs to flow back into a way you have your country go back. So we end up with a structure is less of the catalyst. After the catalyst, if you look at the purple sun on both sides, we call this a gas diffusion layer. So the gas and the hydrogen on, on the anode side need to be evenly distributed on the surface of the catalyst. Wow. So how can you make it evenly distributed? We put a gas diffusion layer, when we call it the GDL. Wow. So we talked about catalyst, we talked about the mass of GDL. And on the other side, it's also near the GDL, it's gas diffusion layer. And it, uh, it is uh, diffused uh, the, the oxygen. Uh, so but we need this two. And finally, we need uh, a plate. And the plate first got uh, the gas channel. So then we can supply the hydrogen uh, on the anode side. The hydrogen then supplies the gas diffusing layer. And the light is evenly distributed to the catalyst behind it. Well, so we need first, we need the channel. Second, we need to get uh, the electrons out. So this one has to be electrically conducted. Uh, so it's called, also called the current. You have to collect the current. Uh, and for that particular thing, um, there is basically it's doing two jobs. So one job is uh, supply the gas. Another job is conduct the current. Uh, and what we end up with, and we call this, uh, that one is a polar plate. Uh, so for this one, it's a polar plate. So this polar plate is castle, is anode polar plate, and that is a castle polar plate. But well, in reality, you can always stack the batteries in a sort of a stack. So the polar plates will become I mean, bifunctional. So on one side, you can supply the oxygen. On the other side, you supply the hydrogen. On one side, you end up with, uh, let's say, potential, I mean, from zero volts into, let's say, 0 0.6 volts, or from 0 0.6 volts, then you can stack into 1.2, and then so on. So then the whole world voltage can be built up, can be built up a pretty powerful machine. So because you can put the two functions into one plate, so basically you got this plate, and you got that plate, assume you got another cell next, next to it, so the two plates will be stacked together. Actually, the one plate will do the two functions. So we end up with that one is called bipolar plate. So that's the fundamental structure. It's, in a way, it's much, much simpler than the engine. But I said that the engine fundamental thing is a PC power crankshaft, three key components. And if you look at a few cell key components, is what well, is the membrane? And uh, not, uh, yeah, it's the membrane in the middle. So the catalyst makes the reaction happens, and very importantly is the bipolar place. Bipolar place will supply the gas as well as it uh, I mean, takes the current out. So that is uh, the three, possibly four key components, then because inside you need the membrane. Uh, so that is the one. Well, so let's look at one by one. Uh, so the key components, let's give an introduction one by one. one, by one. The first is the membrane. Right. So the membrane itself, the membrane I mean, is a basically polymer electrolyte membrane. Right. And the membrane itself can be a very simple plastic film. Right. And it needs, of course, it's thinkable, it needs a stress. Right. And it's kind of too weak. And uh, you need to put uh, combine with the mechanical components. So it needs a certain strength. So that is uh, the first requirement. And it is in the center, as we said, as we are beginning with, uh, we need this bridge. And that bridge is transfer the proton from anode to cathode, essential. So it is uh, the very fundamental material. And it has to be conductive, basically to absorb and uh, provide the proton. And uh, also it's a block uh, with the others. So electrically, it has to be non-conductive because on one side is a catalyst, you got a proton as well as the electron. On the other side, you got uh, the oxygen ions and the power also absorb the action with the proton and the electrons. So this membrane, this membrane right in the middle, can only you build that bridge is only for proton. 
So therefore, it has to be electrically insulated, insulated because it cannot conduct any electron. What thickness? Well, thickness is a challenge. But well, you see, I mean, uh, why the membranes is so limited? But uh, I mean, the number uh, the manufacturing in the world is so limited is because of the thickness. But if it's uh, too thick, first it takes a much much longer time really to get uh, the reaction going. And second, even more difficult, the worst thing is, is if it's too thick, it needs too much water. Right? And too much water is difficult uh, to manage in the system like this. And uh, so in reality, we end up with is uh, the thinner, in a, in a way, is uh, the thinner the better. Right? So currently 20 microns or even thinner. So we're talking about, for example, if you look at the Toyota ones, I think the latest they are still sell stack for the media. It's around 15, uh, and uh, so 20. We started around 50, 50 microns, and we just used the thinner, thinner, thinner. And we found that the thinner one is much better. But it's high rate of water uptake. That's quite important because the water in reality is the medium to get the proton from one side to another side. Uh, and the membrane itself simply is the bridge. It's this is the water, this is the way of carry the proton. So that is the mandrel. And uh, so, electrically, I mean, material wise, the structure is the PTFE, we call it. So, yeah, and the PTFE. So, basically, that is uh, the key materials. It's a polytyrofluoroethylene. So, and uh, the name is a bit too long, but I don't think any electric, I mean, few cell guys will have a lot to read to this name. But we always use the word PTFE. The PTFE basically is a sulfonated uh, material, and it is uh, the 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 sulf uh, the sulfur really give us the potential as uh, the strong acid for one particular environment, and then for that environment to absorb and provide the proton, and in other words, to let proton cross from one side to another. So that is the material. Uh, for the membrane. So the casing is a PTFE. Uh, the rest of the structure is just a polyethylene. Uh, basically, it's not much different from other really, uh, materials. And uh, so, it's on, <coughs> on the, basically, on the region side, it has to be hydrophobic and hydrophilic. You have to play this performance very carefully because, in one way, it needs to take the water. And the water, as I, as we said, is uh, the vehicle really transport proton from one side to another side, and we need the water. But and if the water is too much, it's a flooding system. So that is the one. That is a, what we need to really evaluate the true performance: hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Uh, and the manufacturer at the moment is mainly as uh, is a nothing. And it's made really the nothing is uh, the trade name, and it's made uh, by the company. Uh, or what's that company? Forgot. I mean, it's on my list, so, but later on, possibly it'll come back. So, there are a few other manufacturers, right? So there's four, there's three, M. Right? So, there are different manufacturers, but they're not widely being made. A uh, couple of reasons. First, uh, there's a, a technical challenge to make uh, such a thin membrane. And the third and the second, possibly more important, the market so far for fuel cell is not that big. So that's a limited amount. But fundamentally, the material is quite straightforward. It's PTSD, put on the polyacid. But, and the proton membrane and the pump, basically, hydration of the membrane is quite important. We need to provide enough water, actually, the right amount of the water. And to the membrane to make it conduct the, pro, uh, uh, the protons. And uh, the membrane hydration is defined a molecule, and uh, so basically per uh, acid site, uh, site. And uh, the hydration is really quite important. Dry, you lose the performance, as I said, too much water, you also lose the performance because of flooding. But the conductivity is quite important, it's, uh, it's directly a function of a community. Uh, if there's uh, no water in the membrane, the conductivity is extremely poor. But by the time you saturate it, which is can reach right to the amount, 
flow, which gave you the best membrane conductivity, basically the conductivity or total conductivity, the least provided the least internal resistance to the fuel cell. So that's quite important for high efficient operation. Right? So we need to keep it on the saturated condition for the membrane. Requirement. So the next requirement is that the membrane in the middle, we have two layers of catalyst. One layer of catalyst is for hydrogen, one layer of catalyst is for oxygen. For the catalyst, well, the catalyst structure in a way is like that. So we end up with is uh, we need a proton as a catalyst. As a, a function as a catalyst, the important thing is 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 not it's a quantity, but right? you need a lot of the, I mean, a large quantity of the catalyst. But the large quantity in reality is reflected to the surface area. Right? The larger the surface area is, the better the chance of the gas will meet the catalyst surface and at the surface provide that reaction with heat. How can you enlarge the surface? So enlarge the surface is to make the size of the catalyst, assume it is a ball, uh, size small, as small as possible you can, uh, the tiny, tiny balls. That's provide I mean, the largest surface area by, more, uh, by the mass. So the smallest mass provides the largest surface area is got to be the smallest to I mean, size of the catalyst. It's so small, we're talking about nano sizes, but one or two or three nanos. That is uh, the platinum, the uh, in average diameter of the catalyst. But for that kind of small catalyst, it's difficult, it's almost impossible to coat on the surface of the membrane, because of the membrane, that's one surface we need a catalyst, right? It's almost impossible to organize, you know, organize the weight to, to, to load on the surface. Right? So the way to do that is then you end up with the carbon, the carbon particles. Right? You use a carbon particle, basically the larger ball, as a substrate. So the nano size of catalyst is then big, the load of sticking away coated on the carbon balls. Right? And the carbon balls is not the size of nano. You can make it micro scale. Micro scale the particles, carbon particles. And then you got all the platinum nanoparticles on that. The next thing is you manage coating a uh, coat the large micro sized particles on the surface of the membrane. Or alternatively, on the surface, inner surface of the gas layer. Right? And then you put them together, you end up with the following structure. Basically, that's the structure. Right? If we say that is the membrane on this side, on the left hand side is the membrane, and then next to it, that is the catalyst. Right? And that catalyst is managed by the large carbon balls or the substrate. And on the substrate, you put uh, the nano dot, the nano sized platinum catalyst. So that is the catalyst. The carbon is not the catalyst, it's just a substrate. Right. And the next to it, then we need a gas diffusion layer. So basically, that's a little you know, gas diffusion layer. The gas diffusion layer's purpose is to get the gas in and distribute it evenly. And they provide the evenly distributed gas and uh, react on the surface of the catalyst. And after the after the reaction of the catalyst, then you provide the proton through the membrane, or you take the proton from the membrane on the anode side, <coughs> on the cathode side. So you end up with that sort of story. And uh, so we end up with uh, the catalyst layer, and we got a gas diffusing layer, and we need also to have the channels to let the proton and be taken at the catalyst layer at an, on the cathode side, be taken away, then can react with oxygen to into the water, and the water then get into the gas diffusing layer. So the gas diffusing layer they should have a, a performance or property or capability to take the water and dissolve it and dissolve it. So that is the one. So 
this one is really the GDL on the castle side, really two functions. One function is supply the oxygen, and another function is to remove the excessive amount of produced water. Well, and so if you enlarge a bit on the catalyst surface area, that's what you're going to see. Well, and so this size, this picture, if let's say that is a five nanometers, well, overall is about uh, uh, 20 nanometers, um, I mean 10 nanometers, uh, 5, 10, yes, about well, 5, 10, 20, about 20 nanometers of deep size. But so the, the scale is a 5 nanometers. What you can see is the, the black dot, but in this case, the black dot really are the platinum. The platinum is kind of a 1 or 2 nanometer in size, and it's uh, evenly distributed. And the ball, basically, the, the whole ball is of the carbon support. Basically, that's the substrate with is that, is that one. And also, there is a kind of a, a liquid-ish and or glue-ish material. That's what, what it is, a normal, a normal film. And that a normal film is really the conductor. What conductor really I mean, to get what we call the triple reaction and uh, I mean to be successful basically means on the catalyst assume if I supply the oxygen to the catalyst oxygen E is need to be electron out and the proton out so it is a kind of a triple reaction so once in electron out and the proton out. So three things happened at a single site. So for electron out, it need what? It need electric conductivity. So from one end, it need to go to another end, to another end until it's connected with your external circuit. So it has to be electrically conductive. Electrically conductive is reasonably easy. Carbon will do that job. So since the substrate, substrate or carbon balls, right? The carbon balls will make well, almost next to each other and is uh, connected um, and touched with uh, the carbon gas diffusion layer. So that's giving you the sort of a journey, the channel, to channel out uh, the electrons. But the proton is not so easy. But the proton is need to be reach the surface of uh, the membrane. Right? And if it's not reached the membrane, it doesn't react, but you have to take the proton away. So the way between the catalyst and the membrane, right in the middle, is the anomer. Right? So that's the anomer. It's a provided function to guide any protons being formed at the catalyst side into the membrane. And once in the membrane, other side will do the opposite reaction, take it out. So in reality, we end up with all this catalyst side and need triple reaction. The triple reaction means it needs to have an open time, open way uh, to light the proton, uh, to let the hydrogen get onto the surface. Uh, and it need a way to link so you can get the electron out. And furthermore, it needs to be, have a, a capacity which is connected to the anomer to get uh, the, uh, produce the proton be transferred into the uh, into the uh, electrolyte, which is the membrane. Right. So that is uh, the requirement. And uh, what is the size for this kind of triple reaction to be happening? And unfortunately, it is very difficult. It is on the nano side. It's not in the micro. So we're talking about the nano size. So that is happened, for example, on this particular surface. If you look at the surface platinum on the edge, well, it has to be open enough to let the oxygen move to the surface. And also, it has to be connected with this carbon ball to get the electron out. And it has to be linked with the anomer and then to get the proton out. So that is your challenge. If it's a buried, completely, I mean, I mean, submerge the into the anomaly, then you block the ch channel, so the, uh, the the hydrogen really cannot flow to the surface. That's a, that that's the challenge. Of course, if it's far away from anomaly, 
you cannot get proton out. So that's basically the difficulty of the fin cell. And if you cannot make into that sort of access, then you lost the efficiency. Uh, and if you can guarantee every single platinum, the platinum nanoparticles has this, I mean, a put out of position, this can trigger the triple reaction, then your efficiency is the ultimate. This is the highest efficiency. But in reality, it's almost impossible to guarantee every single platinum catalyst to do the job and then to do the triple reaction job. So that's the first thing. Second thing, while you are using, so that's one of the big challenge, research challenge, if you're interested in this area. The, the big question is down here, sorry, is the nanoparticles. The nanoparticles down there, I mean, initially you, you coated the catalyst quite nicely, evenly distributed. But while you're using, you produce the water and it's soaked in the water and it's being blown by the gas. Right? You have to supply the hydrogen, on the other side, supply the oxygen, and you have to provide the water on one side, remove the water from the other side. And just, so this is kind of uh, locally, it's a dynamic environment. Once it's in the dynamic environment, the particles is not following your order. It's not like to stay there. Properly, and start moving around a little bit. And once it start moving around a little bit, you got a problem because this kind of metal sides and stuff they like to stick together. But they'll glue them together. Once they glue them together, then you end up with um, the, the the big surface becomes smaller. The surface catalyst the surface area is reducing because they glue together. Uh, that surface is reducing the whole reaction. That's what we call durability. So if you do uh, durability research, um, towards the end, the biggest challenge with many for this technology is to improve the durability. Uh, and that is one of the key mechanism to really sacrifice uh, the durability, reduce the durability. So that is uh, the case in down here. Uh, and uh, so what we're saying is, uh, you know, brief summary, and the interface is very important and the need to provide the triple reaction. And the platinum particles is a depend as it depends on the basically on the catalyst or uh, on the carbon as a substrate. And that uh, the, the particles is so small and the purpose of these tiny particles is to increase the reacting area, improve the efficiency. Then we can use a minimal amount of uh, platinum materials and give us uh, the highest possible performance. And the catalyst layer is pretty thin. We are talking about uh, 10 to 20 microns right, in thickness, so ultra thin. The purpose of it is we don't need, if the catalyst provides enough surface area, we don't need a large amount of it. Right, so that is uh, the catalyst. And furthermore, on the catalyst layer, and uh, there's a different catalyst loading on the anode and the cathode. They are not absolutely equal. I mean, in reality, oxygen part, the cathode part, is more difficult. Concentration is low when you think about you throw the air into the system, and only 21 percent in both cases are the oxygen. And uh, so, oxygen also is a little bit more inertial than the hydrogen, less active. So you need a little bit more catalyst. So cathode down here um, has a significant lower act activity because of the oxygen in air and the more catalyst giving you that uh, I mean, electrochemical potential. Uh, on the anode side, in most cases, it's the pure hydrogen. And the pure hydrogen the activity is higher, you can comparatively know the less catalyst. So cathode anode is not absolutely equal. And uh, generally speaking, that is kind of modern technology, but catalyst loading. On the anode, we can manage a very, very low catalyst loading. It's about 0.05 milligrams per square centimeter. But on the cathode side, you need a significant uh, more. It's about 0.2 on the gold case. But overall, it's about 0.5 per square centimeter. So that is the catalyst loading. And uh, that's a DOE expectation. So uh, 
and the DOE expectation is that let me place the expected equals the last catalyst. And the whole trend is that you less and less. So we are on, we understood better and better about the triple reaction and about the electron protocol conductivities, etc. So we can then potentially less catalyst. So we still have a little bit of challenge down here. And why we see this figure is quite significant is because of the cost. Overall, the fuel cell, if you take a fuel cell as an engine, fuel cell stack cost about half. The rest we call the balance of the plant, and the rest the electric and mechanical machines to support the stack to work properly, that's cost you roughly 50%. Stack itself cost about 50%. And among the 50% of the stack, catalyst cost you about 50%. Right? Because it's a platinum. And we all know platinum is possibly the most expensive metals on Earth. So that's why and we would like to use as little as possible the platinum to give us a reasonable amount of performance. So that is the one. So that is remaining, constantly remaining as a talent. And uh, again, if you are uh, or the researcher uh, and interested in the catalyst in handling the nanoparticles, and uh, that's your research area. Regardless, you're doing the experiments, material science, or the simulation. That is a very research good area. And the potential you can see that is our current. But 0.25, and when you look at uh, the, the DOE, basically Department of Energy, and the look overall looking into the system is half of that. But if you have a, a way to improve by any means, that's a good research area. And another thing is uh, that we, we call this, uh, yeah, we, we mentioned about the triple reaction, and I think we can almost, I uh, mean, um, Brief on this slide. So exactly what we said is we got electrode, we got the uh, uh, substrate, and we need substrate to conduct the, uh, to, uh, to conduct the electrons, and also we need the anomer to conduct the proton to the electrode and then transport to the next one. So that is uh, uh, very straightforward. So the next one. So we go to the membrane when we coat the whole surface with uh, the catalyst, right? and uh, then the next one is a gas diffuser. So we need the gas diffusing layer to stick I mean, on, I mean, damage the membrane, and then we form a middle structure. And the middle structure, often we call the MEA, is a membrane assembly, right? membrane electrolyte assembly, MEA. So for the MEA, the, the final part we need is a GPL, gas diffusion layer. For the gas diffusion layer, when you think about it, there's two fundamental reactions here. One fundamental reaction is distribute the gas, right? the hydrogen on the anode, the oxygen on the cathode. That is what fundamental reaction is needed to distribute the gas evenly onto the surface of the catalyst. They let the catalyst to do the job, right? to do the triple reaction job. So that is the first function. The second function is has to be electrically conductive, right? And uh, to conduct uh, the I mean, taking away the electron from anode and provide the electrons on the opposite the cathode side. Um, basically, there are two kind of a structure. Material-wise, the best material for this kind of thing is uh, I mean, conductivity is carbon. And the carbon also can be formed in fiber. And the fiber, you can always use the carbon fiber making into two ways, right? Into a GDL, uh, into two ways. One way follow like a paper, right? The paper basically are the fibers. And then you can do, I mean, make them into a paper like structure. So that is the one. So basically, carbon paper. Right? You make the carbon fibers. And uh, the fiber that is distributed in, in the way, and uh, it's a behavior performed like a paper. Another way of doing that is the longer carbon fiber, you can always put them into a cloth. The cloth, the cloth, I mean, the structure. So, very much like fibers. Right? So, you can do these two. 
each of them has advantage and has a disadvantage. For this one, the advantage is it's very evenly distributed gas. Right? The poles is almost evenly distributed everywhere. Right? But when you look at the poles, the, the, the dark side basically that is the pole, that's the tiny, tiny holes, and for that the gas in, and the gas in is not only two dimensional flow in x, y, and also it's three dimensional, so it's diffusing through the, the, the paper, if you call it. Well, so that is the beauty of it, evenly distributed. And uh, the carbon cloth, the problem down here is uneven. Well, and uh, you see down here with the fiber, the fiber horizontal, the fiber vertical, and down here is solidly I mean, closed by the fibers. And between the fibers, the horizontal, the vertical next to it, right in the middle down here, turn to be significantly larger than the poles under the fiber. Wow. So it's not an evenly distributed. So that's the disadvantage of it. Advantage of this one is the strength. It's very much like a fiber, uh, the clothes. So it's a give you the strength and give you a little bit of flexibility. So that is the advantage of it. This advantage is the unevenly distributed poles. And the carbon paper, the beauty of that, give you evenly distributed poles, but then doesn't really give you flexibility. So that is the disadvantage of it. So each of them, and for different manufacturers, different fuel cell requirements, you turn to five. People turn to use the either carbon core or the carbon paper. But, and the oversight, I mean, all my test is saving the common paper. Uh, so, and what is the function? The function is not just to let the gas I mean, pass through and diffuse, and it, the, the pri um, primary function is to supply the gas, distribute the gas, let the gas contact with the, the uh, catalyst, for example, that's a pink, the catalyst, the gas diffusing, you get the gas in and let the gas diffuse through this three-dimensional structure and evenly contact with the catalyst. So that's the primary function. The next function is, is the water. Especially in the castle side, it will produce the water. You have to remove the water efficiently. If not, the water will stay inside of the poles. Once the water stays in the poles, you'll block the channel. So the gas cannot diffuse again. You lost the efficiency. So that is another one. And of course, more importantly, it has to be conductive, electrically conductive. Takes the electrons and the past. Of Take the electrons from the catalyst and pass the electrons to the bipolar plates. That the bipolar plates are then externally linked. So it has to be electrically conductive. And the reality is that uh, the, the less the electric resistance, the better the material. So we need a material give us the minimal amount of electron resistance. But, and also another one is the load distribution. But what we're saying is, we got a single cell. Everything we're talking about here is the principle. In reality, the cell is not a single square centimeter. Actually, it's much larger than that. We need a current, a strong, bigger current, multiplied by the high voltage, which is more stacks together, give you overall the power. Because the power you are thinking about for the vehicle application, it's got to be 80 plus kilowatts. Uh, or even standard or even more than that. And you need a larger square surface, a larger surface, and possibly 300 square centimeters or even bigger. Uh, and you need many cells, three, 400 cells together. You stack them together that's into the engine. And the contact, the local contact, it could be evenly distributed among the 300 square centimeter, every single square centimeter the contact to be equally good. If you lose the contact, you can think, you can, you can imagine. If I lose the contact between my GDL with catalyst, and the losing part doesn't react, uh, because you lost the electric conductivity. If the bipolar place lost the contact with my GDL as a gap, that area again 
they lost the electric conductivity. That's all built up as the internal resistance. If the internal resistance is too big, the power is supplied. So you need to make sure every single part is properly connected. That is called really. You have to apply the mechanical clamping force to ensure every single contacting point it needs to be properly contacted. So the load distribution becomes quite important. In most cases, it's made from carbon so far. The beauty of the carbon is uh, electrically, it's, uh, I mean, it's conductive, and mechanically, it's stable. It's, uh, in, uh, it's a resistant, uh, resistive to the electrochemical reactions. The durability, therefore, is very good. So that's the one. Well, and uh, gas diffusing layer, uh, physical requirement, in most cases, is the same. It is uh, kind of a handle fit piece, 300 microns. So it's a quite a thin paper, if you imagine on that. And the porosity is thought to be big, and 80% plus on the porosity. So basically, the carbon fibers between the fibers go to the poles. The poles take majority of the surface area, and the pole size is around the 10 micron ish. So it's a tiny pole. That's a tiny, tiny pole give you that sort of evenly distributed the gas. So, and overall, it's coated with hydrophobic. It has to be somehow resistive to water. And it's power the water, hydrophobic, it's not hydrophilic. The, the way is quite simple to understand. And you produce the water. If it's a hydrophilic, it's trying to catch the water with the edge. And then you end up with a situation likely to block the pores. What you lack is the fiber rejection of the water. Uh, and to let the water flow into the channel. By doing that, then you keep the pores free for the gas. Uh, so that is the one. And uh, compressed. And uh, when you put uh, the multi cells together, and uh, you need to compress them a little bit. So, which means this particular carbon paper need to be compressible. Not that much, but that tiny, tiny compressibility to give you the possibility for the IV, I mean, GV, I mean, gas channel to be properly connected with the gas diffusion layer, as they call the polymer oil. So that is roughly the GDL. And, well, so, and further down that, there is another GDL, gas diffusion layer, we turn to you. It's called the microporous layer. And that microporous layer is simply the thickness uh, is thinner, the pores are a little bit smaller. Well, and, uh, so that is the catalyst. What you try to keep is uh, keep the pores much, much smaller. And uh, then you let uh, the microporous layer typically directly connect with catalyst the layer. So we end up with the situation is uh, two options. One option, you've got a membrane, you've got a catalyst, and you've got a GDL. Uh, let's sandwich them together. And by doing that, because of the, 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 the GDL, the pulse is a little bit too big, and you are not, you have a chance, possibility, the gas simply diffuses through the micropulse, uh, the, the porous layer, uh, the, the GDL, and without really connecting the uh, catalyst. Because the catalyst, remember, it is a nano size catalyst for the coated on the micro sized of substrate. It's a substrate to give you the conductivity. And uh, the gas diffusing layer needs to connect with the substrate to build up the proper electron connecting channel. Right? And if the poles is bigger than my substrate, you may have a chance of some substrate just missed from the linkage with the micro, with the GDL. So the way to improve it between the two, catalyst layer, GDL, you build another layer. Uh, this layer is a function as a gas diffusion, but the pulse is much smaller. You make the pulse almost in a sort of a same, similar size with your substrate. In that case, you improve the connectivity between the substrate, catalyst substrate, and the gas diffusion layer. And that particular layer, we name it as the microporous layer, because the pulse is smaller. 
is on the micro scale. The micron scale is the equivalent or similar size with the micron substrate. So what we end up with is we end up with a multi-layer support to be sandwiched together. Right in the middle of membrane, next to it are two layers catalyst. Next to the catalyst are two layers of microporous layer. And outside the microporous layer, you further sandwich it is a gas diffusion layer. So you end up with a very typical sandwich. That sandwich is seven layers. We call it seven layers of sandwich. You post the seven layers of sandwich together, you give it a name. It's called MDA. <coughs> it's a membrane electrolyte assembly. And so basically, that's the MDA. And the MDA appearance is quite simple. So right in the middle, it is the membrane. And the membrane is electrically, I mean, non-conductive. So therefore, it's also a separator, separating the end of the cathode. And you have to cut, I mean, when you look at it, there's a, a kind of a, a, a spaces being cut out that is designed for gas channel. And right in the middle, the black part, that is uh, the GDL, gas diffusing layer. And behind the, underneath the gas diffusing layer is the microporous layer. Under that microporous layer is the catalyst layer. On the catalyst layer is that membrane. So basically seven layers and then sandwiched together. And uh, then you end up with the MEA. So let's stop here. And to the MEA is the key part. We need to understand structurally, we need to understand functionally. And functionally, it's basically designed for proton I mean, transport from one side into another side, and also designed to take the electrons out of the system. And the third function is to separate, electrically separate the anode and the cathode. So let's take a longer break. We nearly went through two hours. And let's take a 15 minute break. And come back around the 5 to 11, and then we can carry on with another big longer of one hour, and then we'll get it finished. Okay, thank you. Do you stream in for the demand? I'm going to pass for the time. Do you stream in for the demand? Or if you want to end your stream, end in take it. End for the demand.